Good morning. Good morning. Okay, I think that should be fine. I have my phone here just to tell me the time. So um, I will talk about 45 minutes. So stay with me. Um, let me start with the usual, let's say, um, introductions. Very quickly for myself and then for my institution that I represent. So I, I come from Cyprus, first of all. I'm, I'm Cypriot, um, but I live in Torino, in Italy. Uh, before I lived in Brussels, Belgium, before that in London, and before that in Cyprus. Um, I, was, I was a teacher. I was a teacher in secondary education. So today I will speak about vocational education, but in fact, um, I was trained as, as a teacher, uh, what in England they call the PGCE, yeah? the, the certificate for, uh, in order to be able to teach. I, I was the advisor to, to, to ministers in different periods of my life, uh, ministers in my country of education, in Greece, but also when I was in Brussels, I was working closely with most of the ministers of the EU countries. I was the advisor to the EU commissioner, so I was in the cabinet of the EU commissioner the period 2010 to 2015. Then I moved to Torino. Torino is, uh, is a place that is hosting one of the European agencies, which is called ETF. In fact, I can change the slide now. The European Training Foundation. I don't know if you're familiar with the terminology of EU agencies, but I'm, I'm sure you know, for example, because of the COVID era, the uh, medicine agency, which is the one actually approving the, the vaccinations. It's an agency exactly with the same status as, as mine. Yeah? So Brussels, basically the headquarters, the EU, they decentralize certain actions that they cannot manage from the center. And that's when they create an agency. So there's an agency for medicine, my agency for uh, training, there's an agency for defense, there's an agency for asylum, blah, blah, blah. 46 agencies all around Europe. So I am an EU civic servant, yeah? That's, that's what I do. I'm the head of unit of policy advice, and I will explain now to say that policy advice, let's say in our, in our work, is, is linked with countries mainly outside the EU. We are the only EU agency from the 46 I mentioned earlier that we work exclusively with countries outside the EU. So you will see some, I'm, I'm preparing you now because you will see some, some acronyms in my presentation. They refer to groups of countries outside the EU. So we work with what we call partner countries. So we work with Central Asia countries. These are the stand countries, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan. Then we work with Eastern partnership countries. This is Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus. Uh, then is the Southeastern Europe and Turkey, where we have, let's say, the candidate countries. So that's Serbia, North Macedonia, Albania, Turkey, um, and then uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Kosovo. And we work also with the other group, which is Southeast Mediterranean, which is all the North African countries, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, Egypt, uh, Syria, uh, all the way to Israel. Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan. So these are the 29 countries that we work with. But I have to say that lately, we, we get many requests to work beyond those countries. So we work a lot with, with Africa, for example. When we're talking about vocational education and training, what we call vet schools, it's actually growing as a policy area much faster than the policy area of general education and training. So um, in terms of policies. So Africa, for example, is one of the continents that we are asked to work more and more. We work, for example, on uh, developing continental qualification frameworks for the whole Africa uh, for the whole Africa, 55 countries in Africa. They're working now to combine their qualifications so this could be 
uh, relevant to other qualification frameworks, like, like the European qualification framework, for example. We work also with um, countries beyond that. I will mention later on Canada or Australia, and that is mainly linked with the idea of the centers of vocational excellence that I will refer in more detail in my speech today. So in my speech today, <clears throat> I will refer to the enabling factors for leadership to support improvement, which is the main topic of your conference today. And thank you, Milan, for the invitation. Perhaps I should have started with that, to thank you for, for inviting me to be here. Um, <clears throat> then I will try to contextualize that and make it applicable to, to vets. So when you hear me talking about school, you need to think of vet school. It's still a school, students, parents, partners, and so on, but it's, there are differences as well. And whatever I would say might not be completely applicable to the schools that you are more familiar with. And then I will refer to the model of centers of vocational excellence. I know very well, and I always start with that, that when we're talking about excellence in general, this is a disputed term. We know that, we understand that. It's often seen as an elitist sort of process, that it leaves behind instead of bringing forward. And in my role as advisor, I, I never advised, in fact, that countries should build centers of vocational excellence. I, I would not be in favor of that. But what is true is that centers of vocational excellence today, they are growing all around the world. And I will give many examples today. And they absorb resources. So there is a huge discussion of what are they? How do they work? And it's in this context that we work in ETF to study the centers of excellence. And we were the first ones to say that there has to be a transmission of excellence. So they need to give back to the education and training system. So I will refer to them not out of admiration, but because we can learn many things from them that could be applied in any other context. And that I will, I will go in much more detail. So enabling factors for, for school improvement, school autonomy and financing. And I'm, I'm, I'm referring to this more from the policy side of you, yeah? So when you are designing policies, when the, the politicians are designing policies, or the policy shapers are helping to design um, policies, what are those factors that they consider? They are slightly different from the factors of, of a head teacher, for example, who is within the school. Some of them are the same. Some of them are different. So school autonomy and financing, it's fundamental. And when we say autonomy, we are referring not only to, to the financing element, to the ability of the school, of the vet school, or any school to, to have its own budget, but to recruit teachers, to train teachers, to design its own curriculum, or shape curriculum when it's needed. This is fundamental for a vocational, uh, for a vet school, because of course the curricula need to be designed in line also with, with the labor market, with what is happening in, in the world of work. So that flexibility, that autonomy is crucial when we're talking about, and is linked with, with leadership, because it's, it's an enabling factor. Once you have that, then the leader has a different value. Leadership and continuity, this is the key. I will argue today that leadership is not only the privilege of the leaders. You know, as a head school, you can talk about leadership. But it's not only the head school has, that has a saying or can impact the leadership of his or her own school. If you have a minister, for example, and you're in a very centralized system, then his or her decisions affect the way that you apply leadership in your own context. Parents. They have a saying in that. Other partners, and I, I will talk about that in my next point. Partners and ability to forge 
partnerships. One thing is partners, the other one is the ability to forge partnerships with the partners. We often say, you know, we are network, we are well connected and all that. Sometimes it means nothing. Networking partnerships, they are forged. They take energy, you give and take. And it is that sort of relationship. What we have seen is that, especially after the COVID period, where there was huge isolation at the beginning, but then a, a huge expansion because of the digital means, the logic of partnerships, the logic of networks, it's, it's even, even stronger than before. There is a gap on how to do it, but as a logic, is there. Now, when we're talking about vocational schools, and this again has an impact on leadership, we're talking about many, many partners, beyond the usual ones, beyond uh, parents, beyond the community, beyond um, the, the, the teachers, the organized teachers, beyond the students. In a vet school, we're talking about businesses. We're talking about universities. The myth that vocational education does not produce research is not valid anymore. When we're talking about centers of vocational excellence, in some cases we're talking about institutions that they have the ability to produce research, applied research. So they need counterparts. Training, the companies are not used just for placements, for apprenticeships. They're used also as part of the training. Who has the, the state-of-the-art equipment in one in agriculture, for example? Is it the school or is it the business? It's usually the business. So you need that sort of partnership in order to... But it takes a leadership to be able... You see that, that, that the state, the, the stakeholders are a much bigger group than, than in any other context. Pedagogy and professional development. I, I heard yesterday some, some of, the, of, of, of the speeches, very interesting. And um, I, I heard yesterday the, the colleague um, talking about, as a leader, you, you cook with what, what you have. I think that was the, the term used yesterday. And it's, it's very true. What if we have different, though, and we have to cook something else with a different, different material, different partnerships, different, different curricula, different teachers, different uh, aspirations, and so on. So, the pedagogy and professional development is, is, is fundamental. You know it all better than me. Infrastructure. Infrastructure is key. You have seen it with the, with, with, um, during the COVID era with digitalization. We've been investing as policymakers in digitalization the last 20 years. The question to you is, it, were the schools ready when the COVID uh, pandemic uh, exploded to use that, those investments of the last 20 years? I think not, but tell me if you think otherwise. So something went wrong there. These investments didn't really prepare the schools to be ready for that. And it has to do a lot with infrastructure. Infrastructure allows also for better leadership as well. The ability to, to, to share your, 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 your buildings, to bring in other players, that's also part of the, of the school, of a vocational school functioning. I'm testing today with you three slides that you will see now. Um, this is uh, the result of desk research. It's the first time I'm showing them. That is not fully completed, but I'm, I'm confident that is 99% correct. So what we decided to do is to challenge a bit the logic of continuity. And this is directly linked with, with, with leadership. Because we feel that if at the school level we maintain continuity and we have the same leading group, the same leader, for many years, that should be fine. But what if the minister is changing? The policies are changing, the priorities are changing, and often that affects the leadership of the school. So this is what we're looking at here. And what we found out, we, we did this, this test research from 2000 to 2022. So 22 years. We looked into the different regions. So where you see CA, it means Central Asia. 
EAP is Eastern Partnership, SEED stands for uh, Southeastern Europe and Turkey, SEMET is the South Mediterranean uh, and North Africa and East, East uh, Mediterranean. And then is the, the, the last one on my right, on your right, is uh, the one on EU. So what we found out is that first of all the number of ministers is increasing and the change, the numbers of, of ministers changing is also increased. So we have in fact more discontinuity when it comes to policy makers. And that is crucial, it's something that we don't often take into account when we talk about, we talk about the continuity in our school, but you know, that affects the whole thing. A new minister needs, or usually means I will come in and say, ah, this, was not, this policy was not designed by me, by me, I will change it a bit. It means that priorities are usually different and so on. So it has, it has a direct impact. And then you can see there are countries that some of them, Romania for example, has changed 25 ministers of education in 22 years. Germany, on the other hand, with the lowest, has changed 4.7 over 22 years. The next slide might not sound so um, relevant to what we're discussing today, but it's about the average age. When we're talking about leadership though, and what the leadership brings, it's also sometimes linked with age. Not always, but sometimes it does. So the, what we see is that the average age is around 52 of the ministers. In terms of digitalization ability, for example, that should be fine. But in some areas, like Semet, you see in the South um, Eastern Europe, you will see that the average age is much, much higher. We need to analyze a bit more to see what does that mean in terms of leadership. We haven't done that yet. But the finding is that more or less, the average age is, is the same one. This is about the female teachers. So, we have more female leaders than we had before in the position of a minister, but still they are not the majority. Except from some countries, like Denmark, for example, where you, you have the majority. In some countries, they never had a female teacher the last 22 years. And then you can see again in different uh, regions how that fluctuation is and what does it mean. Does it have an impact on leadership? Well, if we think that leadership has a gender dimension, and I do think so, then um, this, this is quite relevant to consider as well. At the level of the ministers, maybe you, there are um, researchers at the level of, of the directors, the head teachers as well. That would be interesting to see. Contextualizing school improvement. Allow me to just do it a I had COVID in the first wave in Italy, and since then I, <laughs> I have to drink some and water every now and then. So, this is where I want to say all these things, where do we apply them? Yeah? So, type of school, does it matter? Does it matter to the type of leadership and how that leadership leads to, to improvement? So, if we have a vet school and a general school, does it? Well, it does somehow. If we have a religious school, I remember my first uh, application for a job back in London in 1998, I was shortlisted, me and another candidate, to um, uh, a girls Catholic school in, in uh, Hampstead Heath in London, very nice posh area of London. I went there for the interview and the, the headmistress, she, she accompanied me to show me the school and it was such a silence in the classrooms. It was girls, only girls. You're entering the classroom and it was so quiet. And I thought, as a newly qualified teacher, I thought that, was, that is a dream. That is the best environment to be. But as a leader, thinking afterwards, I thought, imagine if you take out of the equation the issue of behavior, the issue of whatever comes with it, it makes your, your life easier. So, the type of school plays a role for leadership, and I think it's important to make that transition. 
local or global. I argue that the schools nowadays, they are becoming uh, more global. More global, I don't mean that they're connected only with Erasmus Plus, with different sides of the world. They do that, Comenius and all that. But I mean that they, they see also what others are doing and they learn from each other. And again, that is an important element we need to take into account in policy making and it affects also leadership. Where you have leaders that they can see this, this idea that they can escape from their local boundaries, it brings new dimension to the way we, we perceive school and the functioning of school. So local or global. And some of the networks, some of the partnerships, they are often very global. But it's linked with the, many, the, the enablers I spoke earlier on. Do you have the, the autonomy to do that? Do you have the financing to do that? Do you have the vision to do that? Do you have the opportunities, the instruments? EU comes in there as well. Is that all in place? Use of networks and programs is linked with what I just said. Networking, I will refer in a minute on our network in ETF on centers of vocational excellence. Uh, programs, Erasmus Plus, I heard some speakers yesterday referring to Erasmus Plus, to some of the programs. When I will talk about centers of vocational excellence, the Erasmus Plus for, the, for this financial uh, perspective, that is until 2027, they have allocated 400 million euros to support platforms of vocational excellence. Now, that is the biggest amount attributed to VET ever. And it's for sense of vocational excellence. And what is it for? Is to make platforms, to, to support centers of excellence coming together and uh, solving a, a specific topic, a sector, addressing a specific sector. So there are networks, there are programs that you know, can, um, can affect the improvement of school. And again, they are much linked with, with the logic of leadership. Who are the partners? This is again a crucial question. We heard yesterday about the Parents Association. Parents, by default, are partners in, in, in the education process. And it is thought that perhaps they are not so big partners when it comes to vocational education and training. But try to say that in Italy to a parent who has a son, 30 year old, going to, as an adult learner, doing a, a, that is, as, as, as an apprentice, that is not important, they will disagree. So parents are not only involved in general education and at the age of, of 18 or the compulsory age, a bit lower, but throughout the education. And they themselves are learners in that process as well, not just parents, parents and learners. But you have many other partners. You have the businesses, you have uh, research centers, you have universities, you have communities how important it is to have on your side, as a headmaster, the community. So in Finland, in one of the centers of excellence, very known, Omnia in Helsinki, just outside Helsinki, they were asked a few years ago to train, in a very short period of time, 1,000 migrants, refugees. I cannot think of many schools that they would have this ability to adjust their programs, their teachers, have the infrastructure in place to accommodate that need. They have done it. Omnia has done it. And they're still doing it. You're talking about a different type of organization, of course. It goes into what I will say later on about the center of vocational excellence. But is that sort of relationship that the local community says, why don't we use you to do that. So, yes, why not? We will need A, B, C, D, let's do it. And that is again an issue of uh, leadership, but also resources and many other things. I'm coming to my last part of my presentation, which is about uh, the model now. So I, I refer to sense of excellence, but I didn't say what, what really are, what, what are they? When we say a center of vocational excellence, what is it? A cove. Yeah? What is it? So, a cove, it could be a simple school, which has very specific characteristics that allows that school to thrive for excellence, 
to try to improve. When I say excellence, I refer to the process of improvement. Now, back in 2018, when the European Union identified the centers of vocational excellence as an important policy area, they started looking into that. What do we mean? And they looked into different establishments in, in Europe. One is Omnia, for example, I referred to. They went to Omnia and they said, you know, you call yourself a center of excellence, so what do you do? And they ticked different boxes. They said, you know, we have state-of-the-art equipment. We have the best teachers. We have our own training um, facilities. We work closely with the businesses. We do our own research. We sell products as well. They sell in Omnia. They produce and sell the sauna um, cabins. Yeah? So they have an entrepreneurial sort of dimension. And many other things. Then they went to Spain and they asked Technica in, in, the, in the country of past. And they said, so you call yourself a center of excellence. What do you actually do? And they said, well, we are a hub. When in the past country, any vet school or any other school, in fact, wants to do training of teachers, they come to us. They identify the needs and we do it here in the school. We share facilities with many other schools in the Basque region. We take that. So to cut the long story short, we identified in the EU 25 characteristics of what a center of excellence could do. We haven't found one that does everything. Yeah? But when we're talking about the center of excellence, we are talking about combination of those assets to be able to, to link with the society, to, to have high quality of teachers, to provide solid training, to, to um, uh, be in partnership with, with the businesses, to work with universities, with research, blah, 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 to have an international sort of vision. So that is what I would call a center of vocational excellence. It sounds nice. It doesn't happen in many cases. Most importantly, it sounds nice to the, to the, to the ministers. So when the ministers, and that is a, a problem, there's no minister in the audience, right? No. So when, um, when the ministers want to come up with, with a reform, it is easy to come out and announce, I will make a center of excellence, or I will convert that school into a center of excellence. And what do they do? They boost some money into that. And of course, that makes the picture better. When any other officials would come to visit schools, they would go to that particular school, they will show a good picture of the, of the system, and they're happy. It is a bit of a problem, because of course, it's not the general situation. So, I'm going back to my initial comment. We thought that there is a need for cooperation among centers of vocational excellence, and there is a need to get back to the VET system. And we call it the transmission of excellence, to give back what you take from the public money back for the public good. And that's why I often argue that excellence doesn't have to, to be exclusive. It can be inclusive if you take that parameter into, into, into account. So we have developed a network, <clears throat> which is called the ETF Network for Excellence, what I call here ENE. In two years' time, you can see that we have actually 243, it's a bit old, we have 255 today members from different countries. And you can see some countries, they have contributed to the network with 55 members, like Turkey, for example. They said, you know, these are centers of excellence. We asked the ministers, that's how we got them. We went to the ministers. Why we went to the ministers? Because we wanted them to be part of this discussion exactly for the reason I explained. That now you recognize that these are centers of excellence, what do you do for the rest? So we wrote to all the ministers of education. From some of them we got an answer, from some of them we didn't. What you see here is what we have now in the network. All the studies that I will refer to later on, they refer to this group of centers of vocational excellence. So it's an, it's an international network, it's managed by my team in ETF. I feel confident enough to say that we are probably the best team working on centers of vocational excellence. We are 
I'm joking. We are a big team working on centers of vocational excellence with experts working on teachers' professional development, on autonomy, on financing, on um, work-based learning, on different elements, and they study what happens in this sense of vocational excellence. So the first thing to do is to try to, to quantify that excellence and to connect it with progress. Otherwise, what I said, the transmission of excellence doesn't make any sense if you don't follow improvement, progress. So we have designed a self-assessment tool that helps the sense of excellence identify where they stand, so this is the baseline, but at the same time put targets for the, for the next steps. And what could be more relevant for you, you see the process there, if you go on our website you'll find all that information. We have identified certain dimensions. What could be relevant, and I will say a few more words about it, is the dimension B, which is pedagogy and professional development, where we're looking at the status of pedagogy in a center of vocational excellence, and I will share with you the indicators we're using that might be relevant in, in your work, and the other one is autonomy, because it's linked di directly with the logic of, of leadership and improvement. So, the NSAT, this self-assessment tool, was launched in, in 2021, just um, a few months ago, we launched the second phase of the tool, so we have already the first tranche of, of, of uh, information. We, we have uh, analyzed that. There are different publications, again, on our website. But now we are looking for the next one because we want to make that, that connection with, with improvement. So this is the indicators we're using for, um, for pedagogy and, um, and uh, teachers' professional development. We decided to go for four groups. The first one is foundational. So this is the basic. That could be applicable perhaps in, 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 in a general school as well. So how does pedagogy look in a school? What is, what is that that every school should have? So every school should have a person in charge of professional development. You will see later on that for the mature, for example, says that not only they have a person, but they actually do training as well. That's the next. Then it's developing stage, and then it's mature stage. We're using three stages. The fourth one is helping us to identify those centers of excellence that they want to lead the pack. So if you tell us that we we, we feel that we are leading in the area of pedagogy, then we will put that center of excellence together with a group of other centers of excellence from different countries and say, okay, now you're a group, you're working on that dimension and you're coordinating. That's the fourth, fourth dimension. Yeah? Now, in our questionnaire, we have seen that uh, we have eight dimensions here, but the, the new one we launched just, just a few months ago, it has more dimensions than this one. So this one is from the first slide. So what, what we see here is that most of the schools, of the centers of excellence, they feel very confident to say that they are well developed when it comes to education and business collaboration. So they are confident that they are working closely with the businesses. They are confident that they have good states of development of their staff teachers and trainers, and that they have good level of autonomy. That answers the question again also, what is a center of excellence in its more generic form? It's a, a school or a cluster of schools that has a, these three elements at least. At least that's what they say. You see that they are not so confident to say that they are very well developed in a lifelong learning perspective. To train adults, for example, or to offer initial vocational education to adults or adult training. They are not so confident to say that they're working on smart specialization strategies. These are the strategies that they are designed within regions and identify 
niche areas of development. Yeah? And then a center of excellence says, okay, if in this region, tourism is the niche area, or artificial intelligence is the niche area because there's a university, because, 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 then we as center of excellence, we can connect with that. Yeah? So that is, a, they are not so confident. Not many do that. They have not gone the upper level. Industry 4.0 and digitalization. Again, most of the centers of excellence, they are not confident to say that this is an area that we are really mastering and we are working hard, but it shows an area that they want to improve, they want to work further. Going green, of course, is an area linked with the priority of the EU, going green. We're looking into how a center of excellence contributes to social inclusion and greening. What I mentioned earlier, the example of refugees, for example, and training refugees goes in that direction. And in some sense of excellence, there is that capacity and ability to do that. The next uh, graph shows the correlations. So what we see is that there is a strong correlation between the autonomy and the education business collaboration. So basically what it says is the obvious, that unless you have that autonomy, that sort of leadership in the school to, to uh, design curricula, to train your teachers, any collaboration with, with the businesses will not go far. Because obviously the businesses are also interested on what, you know, on what skills do you, do you provide and how that would make an impact on their own um, growth. So you see there the, the correlations. Also pedagogy. There is a correlation between uh, autonomy, pedagogy and, and um, uh, autonomy. I will close with three slides on autonomy and public-private partnerships because I, I refer to it a lot and it's one of the areas where we are working a lot. We collaborate with um, Omnia is, is, is one of the leading institutions in, in that respect in Finland. What we did here, uh, again, you can find our publication. There's one just a few months ago in 2022. We create sub initiatives, small, small partnerships. When we designed the, the network, we had a, a, dif a difficulty to kick off engagement. You know, it's easy to say, I want to be part of that. It's very difficult to to be engaged and to drive, you know, to, to, to be committed in that. So we wanted to, to kick off that process. So we created within the network small sub-initiatives. And we said this group of 10, 15, 20 centers of excellence from 7, 10, 20 different countries will work in this area. And we identified autonomy as one of the, of the areas. Now, what we found in that work is that autonomy is often linked with public-private partnerships. So whenever we see high levels of autonomy, usually there is some sort of a mechanism of shared responsibility. Shared responsibility has to do with design of programs, it has to do also with financing, it has to do with decision making in some cases. So that is looking for a different model of leadership, of course. So, I'm not sure if it's applicable to many of the general schools, but it is an idea that is, is, is considered for vocational schools, but also general schools as well in some countries. If you look at the city academies, for example, in a way they bring in this model of public-private partnership, some sort of shared responsibility for general schools. The process, how we design the baseline, the policy briefs, for every, um, every cluster, every sub-initiative we create, we want to have some messages for the politicians, for the policy makers, for the policy shapers. So uh, that's, that's the idea. So we don't only create the baseline to say this is your starting point, so let's identify the targets to improve, but we say, okay, what is your message to the, for the general uh, VET system? How can others benefit from it? We go back to the, to the rest of the, of, of, of the network. And we say, okay, we have tested that with a group. 
these are the findings, these are the baselines, see how this applies for you. We work closely with the European Commission on that. We are members of, of a contract now for the international dimension of centers of vocational excellence, so much of that material is used uh, globally nowadays. That was my last slide. I hope I didn't tire you that much. Um, in, my, in my professional uh, life, the last 10, 12 years that I work, I've been working for the European Union, I visit regularly uh, schools. So I, I do um, speeches almost on a weekly basis to different countries, to different schools. I believe I have visited schools in more or less every country in the EU and beyond. Beyond what I said today, which as I said, I don't want to describe myself as a fan of excellence, but I, I want to, to bring ideas forward that we can learn from excellence. What I see in the schools and the leadership as a driving force is commitment. It's something I didn't speak today, but it's something that in my own capacity I feel strongly about. That commitment goes back to the comment that we cook with whatever we have and we cook the best food with whatever we have. And that takes commitment of the leadership of all the actors related. And that would be my closing comment. Thank you for your attention. It's also for the translators because they can't see me and they can't hear me otherwise. So first of all, thank you, thank you very much for, for your presentation um, and thank you for sharing the, um, the, the study on the ministers with us. I think that's very interesting. Um, what I would like to add to what you said, I mean, the European Parents Association has been working with ETF, but with also with other bodies um, to foster vocational education and training in, in the EU and among our parents because parents are very crucial, um, not any longer so much at the age of uh, 18 or 20, but uh, for those who do the, uh, vocational education before, um, it's uh, in some countries it's really hard to convince the parents that that's a good way for their children also. But what I wanted to add to the topic here is I have had the pleasure, not as you visiting so many schools, but the schools that I have seen, and I know some of them, they all have exceptional leaders. Yeah, and they among the most inspiring people that I have ever met. And when you listen to them and when you see how they built this, then yeah, we come back to the topic here that leadership is really, really important. Thank you. Maybe, can you hear me? Yeah. Maybe before some more comments or questions. I was uh, looking with the interest at a number of countries where you uh, sort of found and identified centers of excellence. There was no Czech Republic. Uh, uh, what, can, you comment, can you comment on it, please? <laughs> yes. Um, well, I, I was expecting the question huh? because um, we work, um, we, as, as an agency, our mandate is to, to work with countries outside the EU. So the invitation that I said we addressed to the ministers refers to the countries outside the EU. We have gone to them, we asked them, and they have provided sense of excellence. But then, of course, as, as the numbers were growing, certain centers of excellence from Europe, from EU, they said, we want to be part of that, because especially for, for Erasmus, plus connections, um, in order to make an application, you need this international dimension. So they need partners. 
So immediately from, from Europe, many centers of excellence came forward and they said, we want to be part. But we, we didn't go to them, they came to us. That's, that's the difference, yeah? So we didn't, we didn't have such a, a call from, from Czech Republic. I'm sure there are, I'm sure there are. But, um, you know, in our own study of centers of excellence, what we found is that there are excellent schools who live though in isolation. They do a great job within their own environment, very, very local, but they are not visible, they are not in the radar outside. And it's a pity really because uh, others could benefit from what they do. I've got the suspicion that in, in, in your country as well, but also in, in many other countries, there are many centers of excellence or many good schools that they work in isolation. And they try to find solutions in their problems within this isolation. I think we need this international dimension and, and slowly, slowly it's growing. It's growing a lot. In fact, now I was looking at the latest um, um, facts from Erasmus Plus. The countries outside the EU that are partners in applications for uh, the Centre of Excellence are actually more than, than the, the, the partners from the EU. They cannot lead the project but they can be partisan, and, and they are more in numbers. So it's, it's, it's growing a lot. Thank you. We are just checking the microphone. Is it? Yes, it's working now. Um, thank you very much for your highly interesting presentation. I'm very happy that we have vocational education on board with us here too. Um, um, we come from Finland. Uh, we've been working hard to provide a systematic, comprehensive program for educational leaders in all education forms that last, let's say, three, four years systematically. In relation to vocational education, uh, we often hear, maybe because the vocational education in Finland is so strongly based on the um, showing or demonstrating one's capabilities, that uh, they don't need, let's say, the more formal educational leadership education for people working as educational leaders in vocational education. I would be very interested in how you see that in the European perspective. How do vocational education, educational leaders want to develop their educational leadership capabilities? That's the question. Thank you. I think there's another comment and then I will refer to both. Yeah. Still not work. It is okay. Okay, now, thank you uh, uh, for your uh, great uh, presentation. Uh, that was really very enjoyable. I have two very short remarks and one question. Uh, the, the remarks. Uh, I was really very glad that you uh, stressed so much uh, the uh, uh, the importance of uh, school autonomy because I think it is uh, a real uh, crucial question uh, to have adaptive and, uh, and uh, uh, capability for improving uh, schools, for improvement uh, schools. Uh, the other is, uh, you mentioned that uh, several times, uh, the excellence, excellence of a certain school uh, not, is not uh, visible, uh, sometimes uh, neither in, uh, in the surroundings. Uh, however, it is really very important uh, as school can teach schools. So when uh, it is a special kind of learning when uh, both uh, the learner and the quasi teacher are organizations. Uh, and my question, uh, your self-assessment uh, tool seems really very, very interesting. And uh, 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 do you have any relation uh, with uh, or to the uh, earlier uh, uh, review process which was uh, elaborated for especially uh, vocational schools uh, inside in uh, uh, Europe that was based on the European quality framework. 
Thank you. Thank you. On the, on the, first, uh, on the first point, um, for the EU view on, on, on leadership and, and the model, I think the, the model was the, idea, the, the, the question, if that is the Finnish model or something else. Well, the, the, the EU, as you know, doesn't promote, you know, is the principle of subsidiarity. Yeah? The principle of subsidiarity means that responsible for the reforms, educational reforms in the countries is taken by the country or the region. Um, so what the EU does is to, to put forward policy frameworks. These are called communications and this express the opinion of the commission and what they do, they never say this is the model, but is saying consider this as a potential model and that could become a stronger tool into a council recommendation which of course is adopted by the ministers where it has a different language usually it pushes a bit more to to consider and when the eu is becoming a bit more the last 15 years in pushing policies through subsidiarity is by monitoring the entry point to the national policies is through monitoring yeah so what the eu does is monitoring progress through different processes and that's the way to to show that there is space for improvement that to put the framework now in the 2018 um, um, recommendation for the european area of education which is the aspiration by 2025 to create a, a joint european area for education there is reference to 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 the value of, of leadership at the school level, but also beyond that. I don't personally think that the Finnish model could be a model to be used by many other countries, uh, especially countries in the south, where the leadership is much more vertical. Um, in, in Finland, you would not be able to identify the, the headmaster in the school. Um, you wouldn't be able to identify the minister, by the way. <laughs> Uh, that is not the case in, 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 in countries in the south. It's much more vertical, it's much more um, position-oriented. And of course, the status of leadership is, is different. The mechanisms are different as well. Support mechanisms are different. So uh, I, I, I would love to see it in other countries, personally. But um, it wouldn't be the job of the EU to say, this is the model. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's there like the Finnish system. The Finnish system nowadays is it's building that hegemony when it comes to general education globally. The biggest attention of Finland, by the way, these days at policy level is not to influence the other EU countries, it's to influence countries beyond the, beyond the EU. Um, Africa, for example. The, the, the amount of money that the Finnish uh, state puts to, to uh, put through ideas of the Finnish model to countries outside beyond the EU, it's, it's enormous. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's that sort of relationship. Now on the, on the question of, on the self-assessment tool, no, we haven't. Um, we started from scratch and there's an advantage, there's a disadvantage. Um, the advantage was that we were looking into a new um, policy domain, a new area. Centers of excellence exist for decades, it's not new, but the, the study and the conversion of the centers of excellence into a policy area is, is new. So we wanted to, to capture that from, from, from the ground. So we didn't go with any prerequisites or, or any... Um, so we said, let's, let's define what is the baseline. Now, the self-assessment tool is, is, is quite unique. It's quite unique. We're developing now with the Commission a separate tool. We had the question, for example, can we look at excellence in, in sectors, economic sectors? When you're talking about education and business collaboration, for example, could it be different when you're talking about the sector of agriculture and the sector of fisheries? 
Could infrastructure be different? Could relationships with research be different and so on? And there are differences. We decided not to. So we don't go by sector. So when we're bringing together centers of excellence to work on autonomy, we don't look at if, if your specialization as a center of excellence is water. Netherlands, for example, is, is a classic case. Or if it's tourism. So let's, let's discuss about that in a vertical way. I think the next, the next level will be that, to look into sectors. To look. Then we don't address all the characteristics of the European Union. The, the EU has identified, as I said, 25 characteristics. For the Erasmus+, Plus, for the new call that is coming up, I think they will apply only 20 characteristics. For those characteristics, we are designing the tool now. We, we have a contract with the Commission exactly for that. So it would be the second self-assessment tool, not based on dimensions of excellence, but based on characteristics of centers of vocational excellence. This work will develop in the next two or three years. I'm, I'm hopeful that at the end we will be able to combine that and go back to initial studies and see, okay, where did we start? What does it mean for the general vet and where we are with the sense of excellence? But it's, it's still a work, work in progress. Any, yes. Thank you, Michaela Zawarsznik, Slovenia. Uh, I would like to go back to what my colleague Mika uh, was asking, and I think he was referring to as well. Um, in Slovenia, but as far as I know, not just in Slovenia, um, we have difficulties in attracting vet leaders into in-service training. Um, we have had quite a lot of discussions of what is different in the general education and preschool education um, in service needs of leaders in comparison to vet leaders. And I think that this is what partly my colleague Mika was asking as well. So my question is, what is your personal opinion in a sense and in terms of the experience you've got in uh, vet um, uh, education? Is there a difference and what sort of difference it is in terms of needs? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I would shift a bit the question towards the logic of attractiveness. Yeah? I mean, vocational education training is, is suffering from, from attractiveness. And that is the case in many countries. With the exception of few countries in, in EU, Germany, Austria, uh, Switzerland, um, the rest of the countries, there is an issue of attractiveness. So for students, not for leaders. But I would assume, I don't know about the fact that such, but I would assume that if there is an issue of attractiveness for students, that would have an impact on the attractiveness of, of headmasters as well, or, or leaders for vets. Because it's perceived often as a lower level education. So the leader of that institution would be perceived as a lower level leader in a way. That would be the, the threat in, in my view. Well, VET is changing. I mean, it was the, the low attractiveness of VET was a bigger issue a few decades ago. I think now with the um, blurred boundaries between um, higher VET and higher education and the opportunities that VET could open to different pathways, which is the case in many countries, that perception is changing. And I think the issue of attractiveness of leaders for that will change together with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I agree with you. But my, my question was actually, it's not a problem of attracting leaders in the position of leadership. So. It's not that the case. It's the case of in-service training. So once they are already in position, in what sense do their needs of in-service leadership training differ in relation to okay. general education? Thank Sorry, you. I got it all wrong. It's I, th okay. I, I okay. thought it was attractiveness you're referring to. Well, um, 
I wouldn't know for the member states. I mean, that would be more work related to CEDEFOP. CEDEFOP is the other agency working on, on VET in, in member states. It's based in Thessaloniki. Um, now, what, what we have in, um, in some countries that I know from the Centers of Excellence, the Technica, for example, example in the Basque country, it's a training center also for um, teachers and head teachers as well, for leaders. So, but again, that comes from the needs of, of the schools. So you need a cluster there to identify the needs. And the status, of course, of head teachers is different and is seen as something different from the general education because there is a much more entrepreneurial approach in, in the center of vocational excellence. So you need a different type of leadership there. Um, the number of partners is, is bigger in a vocational education training. The equipment, the infrastructure is much more expensive. There's a lot of um, uh, procurement in, in a vet school where you have to acquire the new equipment uh, to provide the training. So that is linked with, with, with the role of, of the headmaster and the leader, which is not so much the case in a, in a, so you need that training indeed. It's a different profile in a way in some respect. So, but that is provided by these clusters. Um, in some other countries in Turkey, that is done again with, uh, there's a special training course for teachers, uh, head teachers for vet schools. And there are huge networks. You can imagine a country like Turkey with 1 million teachers how many of the courses are online. They have in big cities places for training where you can you create the group, head teachers or vet head teachers, and, and they do it like that. It's, it's quite well organized. Uh, but I, I wouldn't know to compare it with other countries in the EU apart from the examples that I, I have seen myself. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Any other question or comments? Doesn't seem so. Uh, Georgios, thank you very much once again for your very interesting uh, contribution. I'm very pleased we had a chance to uh, have a view into the field of vocational area, which is so rarely being uh, discussed uh, at our forum. So once again, thank you very much and all the best. Thank you.